All right. I believe we are good. Thank you everyone this morning for your patience. As uh, Caleb and I just got off a podcast, it got a little, uh, it got a little fiery there. We were pretty <laughs> passionate on that podcast, Caleb. Yeah, you know, sometimes, sometimes we get a little bit passionate. You know, it's Jesus every now and then. That. Yeah. So, all right. Well. Um, Hey, I'm here. This is a this is the first Thursday that I'm actually here with you. So I'll throw the ball to you. This is this is your week. This is your day here. Funny. Yeah. So you know, and it's funny because you know we're on separate screens, but the behind the scenes reality is we're in the same building too. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, I'm actually um, just down the hall. Here, you know what? Caleb is behind that door right there. <laughs> that I am. <laughs> but we, we felt like the Zoom thing worked better instead of me like sitting next to him and looking like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Yeah, you know, on a camera like this on your phone, you can only get so uh, far apart. You know? <laughs> we wouldn't be observing social distancing. That's right. Well, yeah, so uh, we're picking up our study in Daniel, and uh, we finished up talking about the interpretation of the dream, and, you know, at the end of that, we, we see kind of Nebuchadnezzar having this moment where he, I don't know, he appears like he is repenting and, and extolling the God of Daniel. Um, but we're going to see a little bit more of what Nebuchadnezzar's life brings. Uh, why don't we just pick up? We're going to read actually starting in verse 48 of chapter 2. And we're going to go all the way through chapter 3, verse 12. So, um, as some of you might know, in the original writing of scripture, there were no chapter numbers and verse numbers. So, even though we're crossing over from chapter 2 to chapter 3, uh, originally that wasn't there. So. Uh, it may seem a little weird for us to read from two chapters, but in the reality, it's not all that uncommon, not all that weird. So starting in verse 48, then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. Uh, chapter three. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth was six cubits. 90 feet tall, nine feet wide. Um, he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. I think Daniel wants to know, wants us to know who was all there. He says it twice. Um, they're all there for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud. You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the, the horn, the pipe, the lyre, trigon, harp, um, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. 
There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So we last saw Daniel interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar extols Daniel and his God. Daniel is showered with gifts and titles. He's made a ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect. You know, this reminds me a lot of Dan, uh, Joseph and how Joseph interprets the dream of Pharaoh. And Joseph is made the viceroy of all of Egypt. So he's given a lot of power and a lot of prestige and a title. You know, basically he answers to nobody but the Pharaoh. Um, I don't know quite if Daniel was now number two in the country, but he is given an immense amount of power, an immense amount of prestige. He makes requests and his friends are appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. So this is a lower position, but still yet lofty and, and you know, higher than where they were. Things are looking up for these guys. And perhaps for a time it was that way. Um, and it's possible that by the time we get to chapter three, as many as 15, 16 years have passed. We don't know that for certain, but some of the people uh, that I was reading um, this week, as I prepared, said that it's possible upwards of 15, 16 years have passed by the time the events of chapter three take place. And Nebuchadnezzar builds an idol. Now, there is some debate as to whether this statue that he builds is of his own likeness or whether it was the likeness of one of the other deities. Um, either way, uh, there would have been the understanding that Nebuchadnezzar in building this was proclaiming how great he was. Even if the image wasn't in his likeness, even if it was Bell or if it was Madoc or one of these other uh, lesser deities that they served. Um, we, we mentioned, I think, in chapter one that Bell was technically kind of like the house god that Nebuchadnezzar served. Um, so even if it was Bell, Nebuchadnezzar, and you can see that by how often in the passage it says, King Nebuchadnezzar set up, King Nebuchadnezzar set up. This is all about Nebuchadnezzar. It's not about Bel. It's not about Madoc. It's not about any of the other deities. This is about Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, so I think that's why, in general, a lot of people assume that it's an image of Nebuchadnezzar because of how often it talks about King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, but it's, there's, there's a chance that it's not an image necessarily of him. He builds this uh, statue uh, on a plain. It's a, a plateau of some sort. And he builds it 90 feet high, nine feet wide, and it's made out of gold. And luckily, likely it's gold plated, not necessarily solid gold. Um, and it's also highly likely that some of the gold that was used to build this was some of the golden instruments that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, melted down and, and used in this statue. And I think there's a, there is a connection between this statue that Nebuchadnezzar builds and the dream that he had, which Daniel provided and interpreted uh, because of the, the, you know, the Lord providing that to him. Um, I think there's this connection. Nebuchadnezzar hears this dream, uh, you know, whether it was 10, 15 years prior or if it was a week prior, it really doesn't matter. Nebuchadnezzar hear, hears that dream and interpretation. And rather than his eyes truly being fixed on the rock cut without hands, Jesus, his eyes are fixed on the golden image portion of it. You know, the portion of the statue in his dream that was, was gold, um, people have taken to stand for Babylon. And I think somewhere in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar, he likes that idea. So he, he builds this, temp, this, uh, this structure, the statue made out of gold. I don't think he quite got the point of the dream that ultimately Jesus was coming. And, you know, Jesus tears down all our idols and all our, our, our kingdoms and all these things. And I don't think Nebuchadnezzar quite understood that. I don't think he got that. Nebuchadnezzar is too busy building his own kingdom. And uh, he's, he's kind of, in a way, like a counterfeit king, if you will. I mean, he legitimately is a king, but Jesus is the truer king. 
Nebuchadnezzar is this lesser, you may even use that word, counterfeit king. Nebuchadnezzar proves to us, this is for my more politically minded friends, why state religion is a bad idea. He proves to us that kings and presidents and, and government officials make very poor church leaders. Now, throughout history, that has often been the way things were done. You know, you look at people like King Henry of England, who started the English Reformation because he wanted a divorce, and the Pope wouldn't provide him that. And you look at even today in the English church, the queen is actually the head of the church. And that's not a very good idea. Uh, we, we see things um, in, in North Korea and places like Iran where the, the head of state is also the head of the church. Um, and honestly, one of the images that I have in my mind when looking at this is kind of that we've seen it in places like North Korea and Iran, kind of like a state pageantry military style parade the king has gathered all these people together, every official. He's, there's this big celebration, a lot of worship, a lot of veneration. And I kind of picture that with like these military parades where like in North Korea, they show all their muscle, they flex their muscle and uh, all the people are there worshiping. It all points to their leader, their king, their president, whoever it is as this powerful ruler that should be worshiped. And yet it's all counterfeit. It's all fake. Uh, just, uh, I have a kind of an interesting observation actually. Um, you know, one of the, one of the evidences that there were people of faith at the founding of America is the fact that there are checks and balances in our governmental system. And the reason there are checks and balances is not because, you know, it was like, you know, political scientists saying, well, this is a, this is a good way to do it. Um, they believed in the doctrine of sin. Mm -hmm. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The heart of man, Jeremiah said, is desperately sick. It's beyond cure. It's wicked. And because they believe that, they knew that absolute power corrupts absolutely, which I think that human history tells us that, right? So um, that's one of the reasons why um, our government is formed the way it is so that no one holds absolute power because of what we see in Nebuchadnezzar. The tendency for self-worship, for self-exaltation is so high um, that checks and balances actually keeps that from happening. And, you know, you see in other nations over the last century or even currently, you see powerful leaders. What do they want to do? They want to get rid of the democratic system. They want to get rid of checks and balances because they want absolute power. And it's just, it's, it's this idea that I'm sovereign. I'm God. I am, I am ultimate. I am what's needed. And you know, that that's exactly what Satan's confession was. I will make myself like God. I will lift myself above the stars. And the Bible says he was cast down. So um, the problem is like, it, it's not that a monarchy couldn't work or, um, it, it's actually not even that a singular leader in whatever governmental model you want could work, but it, it can't, it won't work because of sin. Jesus is the only one who can lead in a solitary way and not just, you know, harm the people that he's serving because Jesus doesn't have a sin nature. So anyway, that was just kind of an interesting observation that I, that oh, I made. that's good. Thank you. You know, and you know, along those lines, how often have political leaders, rulers, monarchs um, used religion as a way of controlling people and um, even gaining a vote? You know, I can, I can remember um, when Bill Clinton ran for president um, to, to secure the, the Christian vote, he attended a Baptist church, I believe it was. Even though before that, I believe he actually was attending a Catholic church. Hmm. So, you know, he, he swapped denominations in order to secure a vote. And it doesn't, don't get me wrong, it's not just a Democratic thing. <laughs> we, you know, we see that in Republicans as well. Um, I think we might have seen just a little, <laughs> just a small example of that. It was 
you know, our president held up a Bible in front of a church. You know, I'll be honest. Uh, I, he looked like he had not held one in a while. <laughs> <laughs> All that aside. Um, yeah, we're, but, we're, you know, we're not trying to grind any political axes here. <laughs> right, this is right. Serving culture, okay? Yeah, but it has been it has been utilized by people for for gain outside of true belief. And you know, kings have done this for for centuries. If you just look through the pages of history, you will see uh, them utilizing religion for their own purposes. You look at the history of England and Scotland. I I, I have an affinity for those things. Mm -hmm. Um, especially English history and, and Scottish history. And you can actually see the battles between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism being played out by different monarchs as they came into power and which religion became the religion of the day. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is part and parcel with it. And, and Nebuchadnezzar is no different. He's instituting that religious you know, uh, system for gain. Yeah, and... And I, I think another observation that, that I made, you know, as you were sharing was, um, you, you, we talked about how <clears throat> God was willing to make himself look bad, it seems, by the defeat of Judah and Jehoiakim and the exile of the, the, the you know, the Jewish people to uh, Babylon. But he had purpose in it, right? His purpose was to glorify his name. Um among the nations. And, and this is all part of that. But I guess one of the observations that I wanted to make, we've already said that one of the observations I wanted to make was things take time. You know, you referenced the possibility of what 15 years being between chapter two and chapter three. Um, <clears throat> we live in an age when <clears throat> we want everything, you know, to be changed right now. And we want God to make sense of it right now. We want justice right now. And, and, and I think it's important to remember that God's plans take time to play out. God, God does not have a, uh, a Twitter account or, you know, a TikTok where in 15 seconds, he's going to try to grab your attention. Oh, no, 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 no. God is eternal. He's the ancient one. And so his plans have been playing out since before the dawn of time. And he is so patient. And you look at, you know, 15 years to God is nothing. But to us, it's like, Man, it's been like this for 15 years. Uh, and yet here we see the glory of God emerging in Babylon, uh, you know, through through Daniel uh, and then eventually through Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. So um, I, I guess that should give us some patience as we consider God's sovereignty and the fact that God works all things for the good, not put it on our timetable or our Facebook uh, timeline or, you know, a 15 second clip uh generation like we're in let's remember that god is working and sometimes it takes a long time for that to happen for that to play out <clears throat> yeah and you, you mentioned god's glory being at work in this and um as well satan is a good counterfeiter he he's not all that creative though he he just kind of mimics the things of god to 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 fight against and so we see this false religion here they've gathered a band there's a herald, which is like a preacher. They've got a false God, false worship, songs dedicated to their God, and this mm. false preacher proclaiming a false gospel, the message of their God. Mm. Nebuchadnezzar wants outward displays of worship. He desires it for himself. But ultimately, he's being driven um, you know, by this counterfeit religion, by this counterfeit worship. Um, people go along with it, too. You know, I don't know how many people didn't bow. I know for sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego did not bow. Maybe there were others. We don't know for sure. Um, but people will worship whoever and whatever impresses them the most. Um, it's idolatry. And we're going to get to that in a second here. But whoever they view to be sovereign, powerful, and benevolent, people will follow. You see that especially in the political spectrum of today. I did not intend to get so political in this conversation. It's just kind of happening naturally well, this is a preview. speaks to it right <laughs> yeah uh but people thought nebuchadnezzar was a god and they gladly bowed you know because you know again they didn't really want to be thrown into the fiery furnace themselves so of course they gladly bowed um but it says here that there were people from all over there were people of different languages and different nationalities so 
it makes me think that there probably were Jewish exiles who were bowing the knee as well. Um, so people are worshiping. Yeah, can I <clears> just also, add one thing about that, Caleb, yeah. too? It's just, I want to just kind of note the cultural pressure. Yeah. Um, it's so easy just to take your cues from culture and say, well, everybody thinks this way, so I guess I ought to think that way. Uh, everybody is exalting this, so I guess I ought to exalt this. Um, <clears throat> and we need we need a voice from outside of our time for us to see clearly. You know, in ancient times, um, they believed the idea of a God of love was stupid. They believed in might makes right and strong arm rules. And if you can dominate another person or another nation and enslave them, you should do it. That's how they thought. You know, the idea of a God of love, of a benevolent God would have been stupid to them. And now here we are today in a modern world, in the modern world thinks the idea of a God of justice and vengeance who has wrath and judges people, you know, our, our society thinks that's stupid. Um, well, how do we know if 2,000 years from now we might not think differently as a human race if the Lord doesn't return? So, you know, my point is we need a voice from outside of our time to, to be our compass and tell us what the truth actually is because our culture and cultural pressure will mislead us. And if you look at the riot that happened in Ephesus in the book of Acts, it says some were shouting one thing, some were shouting another. Most people didn't even know why they were there. And boy, if that doesn't, if that doesn't like display the, the dumpster fire of mob mentality that happens in our society today and social networking and the, you know, the, like the, the outrage uh, frenzy that can happen over even petty things sometimes. Um, we just have to be careful as Christians not to be moved by, by that. We don't take our cues from the crowd. We don't take our cues from culture. We don't take our cues from, you know, the latest, greatest trend. We take our cues from scripture. We take our cues from God. And sometimes that means you have to back off and listen to him in order to see clearly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it's so easy when we read a passage like this um, to kind of transition a little bit here. Um, it's so easy for us to look at this passage and and maybe try to see ourselves in it as well. You know, we look at this and we we make it a story about bravery and not bowing the knee. Um, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, is is not merely a collection of hero stories uh, meant to tell us how good we are or how brave we should be. We should actually read this and see the gospel in it. Um, you know, as Derek mentioned, an outside voice speaking to us uh, from outside, maybe our collective reasoning and our collective mindsets on this. We should see what God is saying in this. And ultimately what God is saying throughout the pages of the Old Testament is he's, he's telling a story and it's a long story. It's not a short chapter book that you can read in a, in a night and feel like you got a grasp of it. It's a long story over thousands of years of telling our need for a savior and that savior is Jesus Christ. So we should read this and see the gospel in it. You know, what, what I think I should see in this is that I'm prone to make and worship idols. I'm prone to wander and, and to stray. Um, but there is a true King and he smashes the idols of my heart. And yes, indeed, he is a King who will stand with me in the fire. Um, and through that, he will strengthen me to endure um, but it's not some courage I can muster. I can't look at the three guys here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and be like, yeah, I'm going to be that. Because the reality is, I might never be faced with something like that. And even, honestly, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we'll see next uh, on Tuesday, their heart was not actually like, we're going to be big and brave and bold so God will rescue us. Their thought was, even if he doesn't. I'm not going to bend the knee. So there's a time to take a stand that is fueled by grace and love for Christ. Uh, but we shouldn't read the Old Testament and go, I got to be a Daniel and I got to be a Shadrach and I got to be a David. Look at the, the stands they took, but also look at the flaws that they had. Many of them had many flaws. Daniel, or not Daniel, David specifically, that's a flawed guy. But the Bible says he has a heart after God. He's, he, he, was, he was a murderer and an adulterer, but he was a man after the heart of God. So I don't look at that and go, I'm supposed to be a David and fight my Goliaths. I go, where is Jesus in this? And my heart should be drawn towards Christ. Now, I want to discuss a little bit before uh, we 
shut down for the day, um, some thoughts about idolatry. And you might think that this statue and all the pageantry that we've discussed and that you know Nebuchadnezzar called forward all these leaders and all this stuff to come worship, they've got the band playing, you know, and honestly, if any of you know what a trigon is, let us know. Uh, we would like to incorporate the trigon in our Sunday gatherings um, in, in regards to worship because we we're not sure what instrument the trigon is. Um, but I'm glad that there were Scottish people there because the bagpipes were playing. Um, but, you know, they've done all these things. You might look at that and kind of laugh because, well, you know, nobody would do that today, right? You know, our idols are no longer these big statues. Our idols are movie stars and celebrities and, and whatever. Yes and no. I want to show you something, and I couldn't think of any like technological way to do this in a great way. So bear with me. I'm just going to hold up my computer. So this is a statue in Turkmenistan. I don't know if you can see it, but right about there is the king of Turkmenistan riding in on a horse. And it's uh, the, the base of the statue, I believe, is made of marble, and the king and his horse are made out of gold. And the people are to gather around it and shout, glory be to, I can't pronounce his name, um, the, the king. This is in North Korea. And I believe they've since added to this. I think there's three statues now. Um, but these are the previous leaders of North Korea. Um, so I think they've added a statue of the current, the current leader, um, Kim Jong-un or whatever his name is. And the people, when they come in front of it, are supposed to worship. And if they don't, they can be in trouble. And this statue, wow, that, that kind of looks maybe perchance like the statue we're talking about today. It's gold. This one is actually 120 feet tall, I believe. But this is of Mao Zedong. I believe is how you pronounce that name. I could be totally wrong. Um, but this was in a province in China. Now, there was such an outcry over the building of that statue that it has since been torn down um, because it was built in an area of China where he had just, his policies had obliterated the people there. And so I, I'm not sure entirely why, but all of a sudden that statue was torn down. So yeah, it still happens today. Kings and politicians, <laughs> They make lousy gods, they make lousy idols. Yet we have a tendency to drift here and there and elevate them to position higher than they deserve. So you've got um, people like Mao and people like Kim Jong-un and, and this guy in Turkmenistan, which Turkmenistan is not that far from Babylon. Um, Babylon is modern day Iraq, then there's Iran, which is Persia. And then over on the other side of all of that um, is, nearby Turkmenistan. Um, so you've got this idolatry, you've got this worship and veneration of people. Um, we There's not really a lot of change in the heart of man over the years. Yes, you know, a couple thousand years ago, uh, longer than that, you know, a few thousand years ago, we were, we'd see people worshiping this big idol, 90 feet tall that, that Nebuchadnezzar builds, but they're still doing it today. And yes, we do build idols of politicians and celebrities and music stars and sports heroes and things like that. What are the idols of our lives? I, I wrote a few things down, beauty, food, careers, wealth, prestige, influence, or even friendship and companionship. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't looking to the rock cut without human hands. He wasn't looking to Jesus. He got caught up in the image. He got caught up in the, the wealth and the, the, the lavishness of his empire. So maybe for us, it doesn't look like a golden statue. Maybe for us, it's, it's something like, I don't know, my amount of followers that I have on Twitter. Maybe for us, it's my political view that I turn into an idol. You know, I know for my daughter, oftentimes it's TV shows or toys, you know, she makes an idol out of those things. I'm gonna give a definition of what idolatry is. And I, at this point, wanna make a completely shameful plug. Um, go check out Grace Walk Radio. 
<laughs> because we did a two-part series on idolatry. So go check it out. <laughs> and as well, we did one on political heroes. Um, so check those out. Grace Walk Radio, you can find that on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you like to get your podcasting. Uh, we also share it it's online. really good. <laughs> we, we like it. But an idol is anything uh, that we place a higher value on, um, a higher value than we place on Christ. It's anything in which you seek to satisfy yourself ultimately outside of God something you seek to find your identity in outside of Christ. It's anything you place a different value on than God does. It's just about anything, including good things that often become idols. Church attendance can be an idol. What church you attend can become an idol. I'm a part of so, you know, such and such, and that's my church, and so therefore I'm right. I'm a part of... Uh, you know, you know, I'm a founding member of this church, and that's my pew. I've sat in it for 30 years. It's an idol. You're placing a different value on it than God does. We talk about this in our in our podcast from Grace Walk Radio, which is Derek and I. Um, it's an over desire of something, which in the Greek is epithumia. I believe I got that right. First John 2:16 talks about over desiring for all that is in the world. The desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. These things will not satisfy you. Beauty fades. Food loses its flavor. Um, you know, I, I love cooking. Um, and sometimes there's nothing more disappointing than when I try a new recipe out and it doesn't satisfy. It, it doesn't hit the mark, right? What... Not that necessarily cooking and having a bad meal is, is idolatry, but we can become idolatrous over food, our careers, what we're chasing after, our goals, wealth, security, all these things outside of Christ, friendships. I mean, I, I know for young people, friendships are often the most important things in life, um, there's nothing worse than stepping into the middle of a teenager's battle with losing friends. <laughs> it's, it's emotional and it's tense and it's difficult. It's anything that we seek to satis satisfy ourselves outside of God. Only God can satisfy. The answer to our idolatry, the answer to our idols is the gospel. The gospel tells us that our hearts are deceitfully wicked. That our hearts are prone to worship other things. We've never once been able to love the Lord our God with all our hearts like he commands in the Ten Commandments. We've always looked away um, from the things that God calls us to. Look at the children of Israel when they're delivered from Egypt. What's the first thing that they do when they cross the Red Sea? Well, the first thing is they sing a song of worship and deliverance. Then Moses um, goes up the mountain and they build a golden calf. How quickly, being removed from the delivering power of God, do they turn to idolatry? So am I. But Jesus fulfilled the law when I wasn't able to. James tells me that if I've failed the law in one area, I've failed it in every area. And I know that I've never been able to love the Lord my God with all my heart all the time perfectly. I just haven't. But Jesus did. And he died and he's risen again. And he saves me through faith and grace. And he smashes my idols. I need to believe. And when my heart drifts, I need to remember Christ and his work. So the reality is King Nebuchadnezzar was himself worshiping an idol. The idol of adoration. And approval of others. He over-desired what others thought of him. He's like the wicked queen from, uh, what is it, uh, Snow White and the S Seven Dwarves? Is that the, I'm a Disney nerd, and I'm tr struggling to remember the name of it, but, you know, this wicked queen it looks in the seven. mirror. What's that? It was Seven Dwarves, yeah. Seven Dwarves, yeah. That is theologically um, accurate. That's theologically accurate, the number of completion. That is <laughs> the complete right. number of dwarves that one should have. Um, 
the wicked queen looks into the mirror and says, who's the fairest one in the land, right? This, that's, that's the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. He demands worship on the external. And what's the punishment if you don't? You're thrown into the fire. Before I move on, I do have a question in all this that it's not deeply theological impacting. So before we move on, Derek, did you have anything that you wanted to add uh, to the conversation on idolatry? No, I just wanted to say that, you know, idols are anything, anything that can, that becomes too important. And, um, you know, if we think that we cannot uh, be tempted by idols like they were in this day, uh, we don't understand the nature of the human heart. Uh, we are addicted to idols and, and all an idol is, is, is something you place a higher value on or a different value on than God does. Right. So, um, you, you know, you pointed out some of those things. And so, um, I think this is one of the main areas that the Christian needs to war against, um, and be aware of as we grow in our faith is what am I making an idol in my life? What am I making too important? Because, um, the, the nature of them is that they are exclusive. In other words, you can't, you can't say, well, I worship God first and I have an idol. Then you don't worship God first. Any more than somebody who says to his wife, sweetheart, you know, I, uh, you're number one. There is a number two, you know, it's this lady <laughs> down the street. She's pretty. So, but you're number one. I mean, number one's great. Uh, well, then she's not number one. But the fact that there's a number two competing for her means she's no longer number one. It's a strange dynamic, but it's the same way with God. And that's why he's jealous. He's a jealous God. So he seeks that exclusivity of our hearts because he knows that when we're most satisfied with him, he's most glorified in us. So anyway, that's yeah. that's my take. Yeah. And again, if you do want a further discussion on that, especially the, the aspect of the jealousy of God, we do talk about that in our podcast. We'll post some links in this. Grace and, Walk Radio. Uh, Grace Walk Radio. We'll post you some links and you can go listen to that. Um, so I had this question when I was reading through this. Now, a little bit of a hint here. Is I actually taught through the book of Daniel um, some years ago in a, in a former small group of, that I was a part of. Monday Night Fire. We had the fire. Um, but we talked about this. And it was at that time that I realized Daniel's not in the picture in chapter three. So where is Daniel? I mean, he's the guy writing this. Where is he? Well, there's a couple thoughts on it. Um, but the real the reality is we just don't know. Um, but the, the two main thoughts in this is that either, and this is probably the most likely, he was actually out of the country on an assignment. Um, being over the province of Babylon, he would have had much political dealings. So it's possible the reason we don't see Daniel here is not that he was they're just hiding in the corner, but it's actually that he's out of the country, um, away on business. And, and later on in the book of Daniel, we'll actually see that he wasn't always in Babylon, um, or at least not in the capital of Babylon. So his position often took him away. Second thought is because he's higher up in the kingdom, he may have been exempt. I personally don't feel like that is the likeliest of scenarios because we see it repeated multiple times how Nebuchadnezzar brought everybody. He brought the satraps, the magistrates, the prefects, all the people. And uh, so I would say that the likeliest scenario is that he's out of the country. And I also don't think that he bowed. I don't think that the reason we don't hear about him is because he bowed. I don't think that's consistent with the character of Daniel. So he's away. But the the three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are here. And it appears pretty obvious that these other king's advisors have it out for them. They're jealous. We saw at the end of chapter two that they had been promoted. And these other guys, their lives were on the line. But here comes Daniel and the three guys, and they prove that they, they have the favor of the king. They answer the dream. They interpret the dream. And now they've got the, the, the king's ear, if you will, and these other advisors have kind of been belittled in the presence of the king. So you know there's jealousy. Plus, these guys are actually Chaldeans, so they're locals. Well, Daniel and the three boys are Jews. So there's probably some tension there, some racial tension. These guys are outsiders. They're not, they're not Chaldeans. They're not Babylonians. They're Jews. 
And here they are getting getting the king's rewards and the king's favor, and we're kicked to the curb. So they know how to manipulate the king, and they come before him and, and you know say, hey, there's some people that didn't bow. And in verse 12, this stands out to me, the way they manipulate him. They say, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They know just what to what button to push with King Nebuchadnezzar. Because ultimately, King Nebuchadnezzar was all about King Nebuchadnezzar. And they informed the king, hey, these guys don't even care what you say. They, they're paying no attention to you. This struck at the core of Nebuchadnezzar's idolatry. That's where we'll leave off. And we'll leave the fiery furnace for Derek to talk on. But before we shut down, I do want to land our, our plane this morning here. As I said earlier and have said in the series, the stories we're reading are not meant to just be ideals that we chase after. You know, be bold and only eat certain foods for Jesus. Don't bow the knee to the government and God will rescue you if you're brave like these guys. That's not the point of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is leading us to Christ. It's a long story, a story of a people that God revealed his law to, and then they couldn't keep that law. He gave them the sacrificial system, and they didn't see what it meant. He sent judges, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Then God gave them kings when they desired kings, and they strayed even further. God gave them prophets, calling them back to God, and ultimately telling of the coming king. All of this pointed to Christ. And even in Nebuchadnezzar, we're being pointed to Christ. Because Jesus is the better king. He is the object of our worship. And he is the one who satisfies. And so as we read these, we actually see that we need a better law keeper. We need a better sacrifice, a better judge, a better king, and a better prophet. We need Jesus. All these other things prove that in and of ourselves, we don't have what it takes to make it. We need Jesus. And yes, Jesus will be with you in the fire. So uh, do you have anything you would like to add there at the end? No, sir. I appreciate your sharing today, Caleb. Great stuff. Uh, appreciate going through the book. It's just, it is amazing to me how you can't get beyond the Bible. You know, people are like, oh, the Bible's not relevant. Really? Because we just talked about like a bunch of things that are absolutely relevant to what's going on right now in society and probably what's going on right now in our lives. So, um, you know, the scripture says uh, what was written in days of old was written for our instruction. And, and uh, I, I'm just thankful that we're, we're finding that grace in this series. And thanks to those that are joining us and uh, pray that you're encouraged as well. So thanks for your ministry today, Caleb. No problem. I enjoy it. All right. Well, with that, until next time, Jesus is enough. God bless you.